<laughs> okay. Well, we are blessed this afternoon to have our dear brother Julius. He's part of a long, rich tradition of American letters. He's the editor of the new journal American Affairs. And uh, he will be reflecting on his own vision, his own Velch and Chow. And we're going to break up, uh, uh, as we've done before, uh, the, the times, the focus on certain issues, but most importantly, of course, to be Socratic and to push and unsettle as well as to empower and illuminate. But we were so very glad to have you, our dear brother, definitely. So our plan is to proceed in the following steps. Uh, uh, asking uh, Julius to begin at each step, then Cornell and I will engage him and open to the, to the class. Uh, first, we're going to ask Julius to introduce himself and tell us something about his intellectual and political trajectory. Then in the second step, we have asked him to give us his interpretation of the present divisions between right and left in American politics and what is new and confusing and revealing about them. Then in the third step, uh, we will turn to political economy, the redirection of the development of the country and its economic structure, both diagnostically and programmatically. Uh, and then in the next step to democracy and nationalism. And finally, in the last step of the conversation that we intend for today, the character of the political and social or class alliances that would be needed to support the alternatives that we will have discussed. Julius, could you then begin by telling us something about your path? Yes, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to, and thank you very much. Uh, if you had told me 10 years ago when I was a student at the college that um, I would now be up here uh, sitting between these two, <laughs> I wouldn't have believed you. And if you had told me that I would be giving my own intellectual history, I would also be even more surprised. But <laughs> with that, I will be happy to, to share it with you. Um, when, I, when I graduated from Harvard uh, in 2008, I was basically, uh, I suppose, a neo, pretty conventional neoconservative, um, mainly because of the people I studied with and the people I knew. Uh, but after that, I ended up uh, going into finance, uh, which is what one did in uh, the mid-2000s, if you went to Harvard. Uh, though I'm very grateful for it, um, especially now as uh, finding myself in, in some of these political discussions, uh, how few uh, economic commentators, especially those espousing a sort of free market viewpoint, actually have spent any time uh, in the private sector at all. Uh, or in markets or business or anything like that. Um, for me, I, I actually had a very unique experience in the financial world because uh, very quickly I ended up doing a lot of work in frontier markets, um, particularly Africa and the Middle East. And uh, maybe one of the first important experiences I had was uh, spending about a month in Afghanistan uh, where I uh, saw fairly quickly the vast distance between what was actually happening in that country and what uh, the sort of political rhetoric was in the United States, especially among uh, my, at the time, political allies. Uh, after that, I ended up having a much more conventional finance trajectory. Um, but even there, I ended up, you know, as an investment analyst, you end up meeting the executives of dozens, maybe hundreds of uh, large cap companies. Uh, and it quickly became apparent to me the gap between uh, the sort of entrepreneurial rhetoric uh, that this was presented as, the kind of discussion of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, and how business was actually 
what the actual incentives were, what was actually being done. And you meet with dozens of these people, and every discussion is about how quickly you can offshore uh, production to China and do more share buybacks. Uh, eventually, the, the, it's impossible to ignore that, that distance between what it's presented as. And I don't say this in a, in a sort of moralistic way, um, at least not yet. But uh, it was very important for me to, to see how the sort of Adam Smith, David Ricardo rhetoric simply didn't have any uh, connection uh, with, with the actual business world. Um, anyway. This brings us to around 2016. Uh, early in the primary campaigns, a group of friends and I started this rather silly anonymous blog called the Journal of American Greatness. It became uh, very popular very quickly, so much so that uh, we basically had to shut it down. Um, and, but it nevertheless showed that there was a lot of interest, I guess, in what we were saying and, and led me to the decision to uh, start American Affairs which launched in February 2017, and uh, we've just begun our third year now. So that's basically my background. Uh, and I, I guess I would say that, um, well, the individual details are not especially important. I think the, you know, the 2016 and, and all these developments are part of a larger moment when it comes to the current state of right and left. And um, I think, uh, you know, I will start by talking about the right. And I'm just, as a caveat, I don't plan to talk a lot about foreign policy here, not because it's not important, but simply because I don't think at this point the sort of failures in Iraq and Afghanistan or maybe uh, the handling of Russia since the end of the Cold War are all that controversial. So I, I'm going to focus domestically. And with respect to the uh, right in the United States, Basically, the intellectual formation that still prevails now um, is what originally coalesced around William F. Buckley and National Review in the 1950s and 60s. And it was uh, very consciously called fusionism. Uh, it's a famously, in the Reagan formulation, a three-legged stool that combines a sort of free market approach in economics with uh, social or religious traditionalism and in a sort of very uh, strong defense and, and kind of overt patriotism. My contention is that this uh, synthesis is now in the midst of, of breaking down. And the reason it is breaking down is because the non-material or non-economic legitimating factors that were used to support the neoliberal economic agenda um, have actually are increasingly being undermined by the neoliberal agenda itself. Uh, in the, during the Cold War, I, I should take a step back and just say that obviously the, you know, the conflict, the theoretical conflict between free market economics and say religious traditionalism is pretty obvious. It was the, the founders of fusionism were well aware of it, um, but they were able to embrace it um, in part because this, these were simply the only coalition that would unite the kind of dissident forces opposed to the New Deal consensus prevailing at the time. And secondly, because the specter of the Soviet Union and revolutionary communism was able to sort of make sense of this uh, coalition, however philosophically untenable. But of course, the Soviet Union is gone, uh, neoliberalism gets more and more, uh, more aggressively implemented in the 80s, 90s. And what you have uh, is increasingly people find that the great threat to these traditional values uh, that were supposed to be supported by markets are actually being undermined by markets. And you can see a number of examples of this um, today. One of the more common ones, for instance, is uh, when it comes to the censor, or you know, when um, social conservatives say pass a law in, uh, in maybe a southern state on on a social conservative issue, um, this is usually defeated not by any left political force, but by uh, large corporation boycotts and threats of boycotts and things like that. 
or all of the complaints about censorship of conservatives and so on, all of these are directed at large sort of quasi-monopolistic private companies. It is not the state. Um, with respect to the uh, defense agenda, right now you have probably half of the American Enterprise Institute, you know, one of the biggest think tanks, right-wing think tanks in DC. Half of them are probably spending a lot of time doing war games on China and Taiwan. And the other half are trying to figure out how to offshore more of our high value added electronics production to China. Um, it simply can't hold together anymore. And the right is in increasing uh, chaos and conflict over these issues. This is effectively uh, what the moment that Trump steps into and leave aside his actual, what his administration has actually done, this is what his rhetoric kind of entered into. Um, ultimately, I think it's, it's a breakdown of kind of, uh, the, way, the way this original fusionism was really rationalized was, was around this kind of Tocquevillian uh, idea that the great threat to traditional virtues and values and, um, and, and community and all of the things conservatives profess to cherish, the threat to this was a sort of overweening state um, that would grow too powerful and uh, reduce and sort of atomize uh, the, the individuals. Um, but what's actually, that, that's increasingly difficult to maintain when the real threat to these so-called little platoons is often the large corporations uh, and the sort of forces of the market that are unconstrained and so on. So suffice it to say that intellectually, politically, uh, the right's in a great deal of turmoil. Also on a very practical level, if you look at where the sort of sources of power are in what you might call the American regime, you can point to say economic power, uh, you can point to um, uh, cultural or intellectual power, and, and the formal state apparatus. As it happens, conservatives have virtually zero cultural uh, power in Hollywood or academia. They have increasingly less economic power uh, in Silicon Valley and finance, etc. And the only place where they actually have any uh, potential to exercise influence at all is within the state itself, precisely the organization that they have been trying to destroy. Um, and, uh, and, and this has sort of all come to a head. And right now, uh, you know, the right is in, um, these arguments haven't been resolved. Uh, it's still a, a, a battle. Um, but it is now, with the advent of Trump, it has become an open sort of conflict. And I guess before moving on to the left, I just want to maybe discuss the, the sociological factors that would prevent a, a movement to what you could call a more, a more statist version of the right. Um, the, the first one is, the first one is simply the, the so-called uh, donor class, um, which is, it's not to say that the donors perhaps don't have other interests beyond preserving their wealth and, and maintaining uh, those sorts of privileges. Uh, many of them do have a lot of uh, other sincerely held beliefs. But they all, at the end of the day, are united by their, their belief in the importance of uh, market economics and, and really their fear that uh, some socialist is going to come along and try to take their stuff. Uh, it makes it very difficult for any right-wing donor movement to, to really do anything in a coordinated fashion on anything other than uh, the neoliberal economic agenda. The second part of it is because the, the right has always had to sort of build kind of para-academic institutions, um, media institutions outside of the mainstream, to carry on its message. It's very used to seeing itself as a sort of embattled fringe. Uh, and that's really part of its, its own identity and self-marketing. 
the advantage of this is that it, it allows for, I think, a very assertive political expression. The disadvantage is that losing a lot of constituents or having a lot of uh, people turn away from you doesn't actually immediately aspire to rethink uh, your positions because you're, you're constantly thinking of yourself as a voice crying in the wilderness anyway. Uh, and the other part is that these institutions, for a lot of people, the, the core group that makes up the sort of audience and key figures of these institutions are often people that really have had no ability and, and really couldn't succeed at doing anything else in any other endeavor of life. Their entire identity is tied up. I, I Sounds harsh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that is my view. And if you spend time at these places, I think you will find a lot of people for whom the ideological affiliation with, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, quirky, idiosyncratic, libertarian thinkers, is really the the, the main source of dignity and fulfillment in their life. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and as a result, they're very committed to these institutions themselves, even if those institutions no longer do very much to advance an agenda, no longer uh, really speak to broad swaths of the populace, uh, even if they don't actually address any pressing problems um, that af afflict you know, much of the country. Um, Anyway, all this, all this means, I, you know, I think you have a lot, most of the intellectual energy actually on the right now, to the extent that it exists, is really looking for a more statist direction. Um, now, there's plenty of disagreements within that, but they're all rethinking neoliberal economics. However, all of the money and all of the institutions, uh, which has really sort of become a roof without foundations, is focused on preserving the 1980s sort of fusionism and, and kind of you know churning out these tracks uh, into into nothingness, um, but it's it's still they they hire a lot of people and they're in D.C. They they they, they appear to be the dominant voice um, of a lot of the Republican elite and most Republican politicians are still very cautious about, um, about crossing them too aggressively. So that is my uh, view of the dynamics at play on the right. I think on the left, there's a somewhat similar, though maybe inverted dynamic, in that for the right, um, the neoliberal economic agenda was essentially, it had to be made ultra prominent. Um, every other Every other uh, position, you know, potential right-wing position or coalition partner had to be uh, brought in and forced to accept that neoliberal market economics were central to whatever other value they wanted to hold. Um, on the left, it seems to me that the, what you could say, traditional left economic positions have essentially been repressed. Uh, the, the, the discussion of capital versus labor, class warfare, skepticism of trade, all that was effectively taken off the agenda. I think you know, exploring why that happened is very interesting. I, I wonder how much of it was, um, you know, did that change the economics? How much of that was a response to the changing nature of the economy and the disappearance of unions, et cetera? I don't know. It's not um, what I'm going to discuss. I, I do think that the 90s uh, must have had a significant effect just because it seems to me that there was this feeling that through sort of technology and technocracy, we could eliminate scarcity. We didn't have to worry about that anymore. Um, we just kind of have to manage it a little better, be a little bit more. Um, you, basically, you, you make neoliberalism with a human face rather than uh, what the, what the you know, Republicans are doing. And, and, but this would effectively solve all of our problems and we can focus on non-material issues. Uh, Nancy Fraser actually has a wonderful discussion of this. Um, she wrote it uh, in American Affairs, she's written about it elsewhere too, uh, called Progressive Neoliberalism, in which the sort of uh, non-material progressive economic uh, 
values effectively serve to legitimate a neoliberal political economy in a different direction. Uh, if I could add anything to that, it would be simply that I think um, really the main attraction of, liberalism, of neoliberalism is less the, say, neoclassical economic agenda element of it, um, and much more what has become the sort of moral orientation of it. And specifically, what it allows is, is the substitution of a sort of personal form of moralism in which every, uh, every political issue is effectively reduced to some form of personal moral position, whether it's compassion or something like that. And you effectively substitute uh, personal morality for collective morality. Because if you accept the basic liberal notion that individuals pursuing kind of their own ends, ultimately it redounds to the benefit of the whole and you don't have to do planning and you don't have to deal with uh, all of these you know, complex, irresolvable uh, disputes, say, between capital and labor. It's a very attractive vision. Um, Needless to say, that vision is now also breaking down because it's precisely, uh, it, it's no longer really possible to square the kind of progressive economic uh, commitments with um, what's actually happened. We can no longer imagine that the non-material outcomes of progressivism uh, can simply be pursued independently of or separated from the economic commitments. And what's interesting to me, especially looking at it um, you know, from outside, is, the, is the, the gap that has actually now opened up between what you could call the elite neoliberal part of the left uh, and the people more committed to more traditionally left economic vision. Um, so you see that with the you know, discussion of Howard Schultz running. Um, the fact that there might be significant divides between maybe what you could call a populist left and this elite corporate left is not something that's really come to the surface um, for a few decades. Uh, and, and, and this is a fairly new development. Also, I see it in the discussion of what actually constitutes the center of the country, the center of the left. For instance, you know, and you could say what you want about polls, but to the extent there are polls, 60% of the country thinks 70% tax rates are a good idea. 45% of Republicans think this. Um, the centrist position is actually this more economically interventionist position. And yet what the Democratic Party defines as the center is you know, socially very aggressively liberal or progressive, but economically uh, essentially neoliberal. But this is actually the radical fringe position. And if you really wanted to reach out to people, the rank and file voters on the right, I think you know, emphasizing the economics, uh, both economic, not only economic redistribution, but re re redevelopment, um, is the most attractive position, and the, the empirical evidence is all there. Anecdotally, I, it's quite obvious uh, to me as someone you know, who spends a lot of time with the right. Uh, but it's, it's the, the Democratic Party and the sort of uh, elite segment of it that is, is most afraid of that. And so they define their own thing as the center. Um, where, where does this leave us? I actually think. We have a basically two choices. I, I think that the counter, maybe counterintuitive fact of the history of the United States is that this, this country only functions when it's effectively a one-party state. So you had, for example, New Deal Democrats, and you had New Deal Republicans like Eisenhower and Nixon. Then you had Reagan, and you have Reagan Democrats like uh, Clinton, most emphatically, and to a large extent, Obama. And today, we are, we are in interregnum. Uh, and my personal view is that right and left, the, the only way forward is actually that right and left will both become more statist and, or if you will, more nationalist. We can talk about that later. Um, 
in which they both effectively, even though the shades of emphases are different, for example, the right will probably always talk about things like international competition, national greatness, um, building the industrial capacity, stuff like that more. And the left will probably always uh, talk about uh, redistribution and equality issues and things like that more. But functionally, they're all going to agree on the major political issues such as free trade and the role of the state and so on, just as they do now in a neoliberal direction and just as they basically did uh, in previous dispensations. So that's one alternative. I think uh, that's the way, that is obviously my preferred outcome. It's the way I think it has to go if we're going to get any positive policy reform. And the other direction is basically that the sort of entrenched uh, interests um, prevent any movement along this direction. And the way that I think that happens is that right now it's sort of, it's perfectly set up such that as long as the sort of right-wing neoliberal fusionist position holds on, it provides a target around which um, basically all the different shades of the left can unite uh, and, and believe themselves to be in opposition to. If the right moved in a more status direction, I think fundamentally the left would split and would be forced to split and would be forced to decide um, between, say, a more Bernie Sanders version, a vision and a more Larry Summers vision. Um, but as long as the neoliberal right remains uh, prominent enough to become the main target, that will not happen. And I think the way it has played out so far is that most of the, the left and the center left has actually elevated and kept that segment of the right alive as the quote unquote responsible opposition and thus has preserved what I think is, is you know, this, this period of, of stasis and that will, will continue as long as uh, that happens and as long as the kind of sociological issues that I mentioned persist. So Julius, one of, one of the striking features of these, of these remarks is your suggestion that there is a disconnection between what the pre-existing political elite on right and left regards as the axis, the center of American politics, and what the majority of the electorate has come to believe. Is that correct? So, so you're saying that the, the dominant forces in American politics <clears throat> continue to be faithful to a neoliberal agenda, but they have lost the conviction of the electorate in its, in its majority. And this then creates an opportunity which political adventurers can step into. That is correct. Yes. And that, and that the alternative consensus of the one-party state mm. has not yet been articulated. It is only in the very early stages. Uh, and it is, you know, I think you will, you're increasingly getting more and more elites to move in this direction. But it is a, it is a long uh, and, and slow process. And I, I, think, I think for the most part, I think most, most of your so-called average voters are, are largely disaffected. Um, from, from both the official positions of both parties. I think this is pretty widely known. You can see it in the polls. I don't think Donald Trump is president if that is not the case. Uh, so I think that has already shifted. Um, but you have, at the elite level, the change is, uh, is much slower. And, and naturally, the elites have a lot more at stake in the status quo order. And so it's not particularly surprising uh, that that is proving the more difficult to move, but I do expect in, if, if the normal forces of elite competition prevail, it, it becomes in more and more of their interest to begin appealing to uh, what is now, a, what is effectively a sort of uh, hidden consensus. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question uh, that, that goes to the bridge between the present vacuum and the possible future consensus. So one of the distinctions that we've explored in our conversations here in the course is the distinction between compensatory and retrospective redistribution. 
accepting the economic arrangements and attempting after the fact to correct their inequalities through progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements versus taking, taking initiatives that uh, influence the original, the primary, the fundamental distribution of advantage through institutional innovation, uh, shaping a wider access to economic and educational opportunity. Now, that distinction is, is not present in the popular consciousness in the United States, or is it? That is, because when you say that the majority is sympathetic to uh, a more democratic distribution of advantage, what do they have in mind? Do they have in mind this corrective redistribution, or are they in principle open to these structural initiatives? My personal view is that they are definitely open to these structural initiatives. I think that is actually the much more popular, it would actually be a much more popular approach. And it is a, an approach that actually combines well with what is typically called nationalism. Um, because it, it can be about more about developing your country uh, that, that can unite around a sort of broader value mm -hmm. object than, than simply uh, uh, redistributing, co co compensating you know, uh, the disadvantaged. I to, think me, to me, it sounds like a surprising statement because it's the, the distinction doesn't seem to be widely recognized by the academics, by the policy experts in the established policy discourse. And yet you say that somehow it can already be intuited by the people. Well, this, we're going to, this is, this is pre precisely what I had prepared to talk yes, about yes. in the political economy. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I can so, only. So, so. <laughs> but but, but I, let's just stick with, a, I, with I, the description I, yes. now. So I, um, I agree with you absolutely that it is much less discussed among the elite segments, including the elite left, and much less popular. And I actually think the reason for that is, is there's, there's basically two ways to look at uh, what everyone, I think at this point it's fairly, it's not especially controversial that the middle class has been hollowed out, the, the working class has sort of been immiserated uh, economically and, and socially. Um, but there's two ways to look at this. One is that the overall economy is fine, and there's just a few people left behind. So all that we need to do is redistribute a little more. And my personal view is that this is not actually accurate. The, the overall economy is, is failing for a variety of reasons that we can get into. Uh, if you look at productivity, it's been in a long-term trend of stagnation and decline. Uh, if you look even, I think actually it's interesting to talk about since we're here at Harvard Law School, there's a lot of talk about the divide between the elites and non-elites. There's absolutely no question that that gap has been growing tremendously. But if you actually think about the position of elites themselves, maybe particularly up and coming elites, uh, you're actually probably worse off than your parents. For instance, um, the opportunities in big law have been pretty stagnant for a while. They've maybe come back a little bit since the absolute bottom, but not that great. In finance, you know, people entering today have much worse prospects than I did when I started. I had much worse prospects than somebody who started in 1980 did. Uh, and I haven't even begun to talk about things like academia or journalism. Um, and even in tech, Wages for tech employees are not that great. If you look at the wages of the 95th percentile wage earner, they've been flat since 2002. Now, those people have been, still been better off because their capital gains have appreciated. But fundamentally, we have a capital gains accumulation economy. And if you have relied on that since 2000, you've done phenomenally well. But if you're relying on labor, even elite labor, you're actually not, uh, you're not really thriving. And um, so that's just one example of my view that underlying these, the, the, the problems, the widely 
discussed problems in, with uh, the working class and middle class is actually the overall decline and, and failures of the neoliberal economy. And so the only way to actually rectify this, if you simply, I, I, don't get me wrong, I think more redistribution at this point is, is the right thing to do, but it's not alone enough. Mm -hmm. The only way to solve these problems is to actually address these underlying uh, uh, economic failures related to the lack of investment, uh, the lack of innovation, the extractive nature of a financialized shareholder economy, which, which is pulling value out of the real economy, putting it into financial assets rather than the other way around. If you fail to address that, then uh, a lot of a lot of these re the, the redistribution issues um, is, is a they're going to be much more contentious. Uh, and B, they, they will probably ultimately not work and, and lead to things like... Well, you know, what, what, what's fascinating to me in terms of your mapping is the degree to which with the weakening, if not near collapse of the old neoliberal consensus, 1945 up until 2008, let's say, that your analysis gives primacy to the economic in ways that are very different than mainstream discourse. Mainstream discourse oftentimes accents much more the kind of weapons of mass distraction in regard to certain kind of issues of everyday life, of even social and cultural, and it downplays the role of class. It downplays the role of the ways in which the globalized financial capitalist economy has been unable to deliver everyday people's needs let alone their desires, as it were. So you end up with, at the analytical level, conservative critiques of contemporary capitalist realities that have elective affinities with left-wing critiques or right-wing critiques, looking very similar to left-wing critiques at the analytical level. Now, we ain't be different in terms of where we end up regarding constructive projects. But is that a fair characterization of what you're putting forward here? I, I think uh, the, only, the only possible area of dispute would be my critique remains uh, a somewhat isolated position, despite whatever my background may be on the right. I don't think we can yet uh, as mm, unfortunately mm, say mm, that the right mm. is, uh, you know, Sympath but more, 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 but more, more and more people in your are. Journal? And, your and journal's that, just not any journal <laughs> now. You've and I do, think, I do think the, <laughs> the rise of China has been a, a game changer uh, for the right. First, because it was always believed that industrial policy doesn't work, state capitalism can never work. The only thing that could possibly work is just more and more shareholder va yeah. value stuff, more markets, no, no tariffs, all that. Well, you can't look at what China has done over the last 30 plus years and, and you know, take that seriously or at least not admit major exceptions. Uh, the other part of it is that, as I said earlier, the right has the, the idea of patriotism and you know, oh, national yeah. strength yeah. is, is yeah. still a very, people take that seriously. Uh, and <laughs> if this happens, you again, Given that the you you know China was 25 years ago, it, it was a truly unipolar world. Now China is going to be the largest economy. They are a peer competitor or ahead of the United States in things like 5G technology, quantum computing, AI. Um, the simple fact is that state capitalism has performed better. And if you care about things like national power, you can't ignore this. So I think from that, pers that, that issue especially has been uh, influential in moving the right more and more toward this notion, not simply that, well, A, not simply that you know, we need more free markets, but also not simply that the, the issue is not just a little more redistribution, mm -hmm. but fundamental weaknesses in the economic organization mm -hmm. itself. But then the fear is, you look, use China in part as a model that goes hand in hand with authoritarian culture, it goes hand in hand with dissenting, uh, suppressing dissenting voices, trade union movements, inability of workers to bring power and pressure to bear when it comes to serious bargaining. And so that could actually be a buttress to authoritarian voices.
in the United States if we're going to be economically competitive, but still have some spaces for dissenting subcultures? Maybe someday. I think right now the chief problem is this uh, very narrow-minded commitment to this kind of neoliberal market agenda, and, and really a, a sort of uh, it's a, it's it's really like a faith movement. Um, hmm. And and I think you know at this that that, that there's an old it's a very old and and uh, kind of there's a long critique on the right that say. Roosevelt and the New Deal was fascism. And every attempt to sort of reorient the economy, to use the state to guide the economy, is, is fascism. This is essential to the whole neoliberal project, really. And that, to me, still seems like by far uh, the, the biggest threat than, than, because I think, you know, everyone, every, no, one, no one pretends to imitate uh, China and that that's you know mm -hmm. kind of instantly mm -hmm. seems like an impractical project, but but people I, I do fear that people use this uh, they use this fear of authoritarianism very dishonestly to mm -hmm. sort of discredit mm -hmm. anything uh, like the New Deal. Absolutely. Shall we open up? Yeah, absolutely. Questions, queries. Do not hesitate. Speak up so we can hear your voice, my brother. Louder, louder, <laughs> um, well, uh, there's, it's, it's certainly correct that um, it, finance is effectively related to globalization. I mean, they're, they're really inseparable. Uh, and I, I, you know, there's sort of two two elements to this. One is this notion of maximizing shareholder value as sort of the be all and end all, uh, the sort of summum bonum of economic activity. Uh, and the, the second part is the sort of need for mobile capital that you, you, know, you can't uh, uh, put any restrictions on the movement of capital. Um, is this, is, this is economically inefficient. And, and so on. Um, the comparison to China, I mean, uh, you know, China still maintains uh, a, essentially a state-controlled financial system uh, that directs investment into the real economy in China. That's not to say everything is great about it, um, but it is, you know, China, A, has a pegged currency, B, it has capital controls. Uh, it has extreme, you know, they may be starting to loosen some of them, but very strict investment restrictions. All of these are opposed by the financial industry. Uh, all of these mean that there's less profit uh, in the financial industry in China, so more activity gets directed somewhere else. Um, and I think if you wanted to sort of revitalize a a, a, a stronger manufacturing and broader high value uh, physical economy here, there's no question that you would have to disincentivize all of the assets that are flowing into sort of financial speculation and financial assets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, 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 wait. 
so there was a very interesting conversation to be had about how this very real good has become virtualized internationally. And landholdings are no longer uh, tied to a place, but have become commodified and virtualized so that you see a phenomenon where major metropolitan cities in the United States are now dominantly becoming owned by foreign corporations or landlords who do not actually use those properties for any other reason than their ownership base. And therefore, displacing or uh, changing the material constraints of the choices that they make in their particular city and how that may relate to their price position or some sort of social uh, point in the particular city. Um. I guess the, first of all, I say it's not, it's not just real estate that has been financialized. Um, every asset, has, you know, oil is also financialized. Um, but uh, real estate specifically does open up a lot of uh, interesting issues. Um, I, think, I think, you know, in my view, actually, the, the sort of, you know, extraordinary urban real estate prices uh, Part of that is, of course, um, a lot of uh, foreign foreign money using it as an asset to, you know, a financialized asset to store wealth uh, and, and get it out of whatever jurisdictions they're in. That itself is a sort of product of the fact that, uh, you know, in, instead of investing, you know, say in Nigeria or something. Um, because of the sort of neoliberal order, it's actually not, the places in the world that need the most investment can't get it. Uh, and, and all of this therefore flows into financial stores of value. Uh, the other element of it is when you have this extreme narrowing of economic activity and potential, uh, you also get this geographic narrowing. So I mean, people talk about things like changing zoning laws and stuff, which I think is in some cases probably right but functionally if you you know if the only uh, economic opportunities are limited to a very small number of sectors tech biotech finance then yes everyone is going to go to silicon valley and boston and new york and a few other places uh, and real estate prices there are sort of inherently uh, in other words you can't solve the real estate pricing issues uh, unless you broaden the economic potential of more geographies. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's directly your question, but uh, it's certainly real estate and financialization uh, brings in a, a number of other problematic effects that, again, the sort of uh, neoliberal model has a hard time dealing with. Mm. Somewhere in the back mm. there, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm. I, I agree with you. I mean, where, where is the money? It's not in some rural, religiously conservative town. It's in prog you know, progressive megacities. So it's totally sensible or economically rational, I guess, for corporations to be catering to that clientele, which is another interesting phenomenon. My point, however, is simply that if you are a conservative and you have been told that uh, free markets and these traditional values are natural allies and, and they're essential partners and you can't have one without the other. And now you're seeing, in fact, that it's not the state, say, that's preventing whatever value commitment you have. It is these economic forces that you yourself have unleashed and voted for. I mean, the Marxist critique has always been the commodification of everything. <laughs> 
leads toward the hollowing out. And therefore, either you control those markets or those markets will colonize the very state that you initially thought was the source of it. And so more and more, if we don't have some kind of democratic accountability of markets with, all, with monopolies at the top, then you know, what are we really talking about? Yeah, I, all that is solid melts into air. Exactly, that's um, that's the Marxist formulation. But, uh, and, and, and again, you know, I mean, that, that, to have you know, right wing brother invoking Marx like that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, uh, we agree. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote my senior thesis on Marx. So you know, was that right, too? Yes. Well, uh, you were prescient. Uh, you were prescient. <laughs> <laughs> no, Marx is not right about everything. But I mean, but the important thing is the ways in which. You know, the quest for truth leads in a lot of different directions. It's not ideologically dictated or foreordained, and, for, for ordained. and therefore, if we're really concerned about how dem democracies are going to be sustained, let alone rights and liberties, we're going to get some realignment here. Well, the, and the interesting thing about this, I mean, the, the early fusionists on the right, they were well aware of mm. this incompatibility. Mm. But over time, especially after the success of Reagan, that all sort of gets forgotten. The other thing that's often not remarked upon is how many of the seminal thinkers of what we call modern conservatism were ex-Marxists. Um, James Burnham, Burnham the, Whitaker Chambers, uh, basically half the Board of National Review are Marxist. And, Max Eastman. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think the, you know, the, in a way, it, it's sort of, I, I kind of, you know, because what they tried to do, or where the movement eventually drifted to, was to, to depoliticization of everything uh, in the name of the free market. Um, I think in a way they, they, they sort of wanted to accomplish the, the Marxist revolution, but not through class struggle, but through this kind of perfect, you know, individual interactions in the marketplace. Uh, so it was an odd, mm -hmm. it was always, I think, a very odd kind of graft and combination. And if it weren't for the practical issues at play, it never would have worked. And again, now that those practical issues are gone, the, mm -hmm. uh, the internal conflicts are. But what, what happens to religion and race and gender and sexual orientation and so forth? These still are important forces one can become so preoccupied with those that you downplay empire and class and economic forces as well, but what happens to those? Because um, well, re religion certainly is not, is not going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, it is actually the religious elements, the most, the most devout, uh, what you would call conservative religious elements on the right are the ones that are the most uh, left, I guess, on the economic issues because they're fundamentally more concerned about preserving uh, their religious commitments and their actual religious communities than they are with some market, which for them was always supposed to be a means to an end anyway. Mm -hmm. um, when you get to, you know, uh, <clears throat> in my view, the racial issues, uh, ugly as they are, come up because of this fear of the state. And because you can have a collective, a community that's defined by the state, in which you know the essential unifying element is citizenship in the state, and for that you can transcend any kind of racial or ethnic construction. But if you are afraid of the state, as conventional conservatism is, mm -hmm. then the uh, then the sense of collective and traditional sorts of unity it needs to come from some subpolitical. Mm. Connection, form of, of bond. And that's when you start talking about the cultural preconditions of such and such. Um, so to me, I actually think uh, even it, it's hard to see perhaps and at this moment, but the, the sort of more nationalist uh, development on the right will actually be much better in terms of being able to, to embrace uh, a, a broader mix of people on ethnic or racial characteristics or whatever. The 
challenge with that, it, it is the libertarianism that motivates uh, the search for those elements as precursors of community. And you see that always with the, 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 the what you would call the most racist elements on the right were always associated uh, with the libertarian, the sort of radical libertarian groups. And I think that for the most part is the attraction uh, of a lot of these things is, is this desire to have strong community without having to have a strong state. Obviously one could disagree mm -hmm. with that, but mm -hmm. I, I think it's hard to uh, dispute it entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's turn the conversation to political economy now. In a way, we'll just continue these mm -hmm. themes. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, well, yeah, begin I, us in that direction. I think continuing it, um, one way to look at our political economic uh, crises, if you will, is that capitalism periodically undergoes what you could call an ownership crisis. Um, initially, you know, all the firms were kind of one entrepreneur family. Then you have the rise of the large corporation, sort of bureaucratic corporation. And then most recently in the 70s, 80s, you had, you know, this kind of big corporate environment, nifty 50 sort of companies. Uh, you had this, the, the sort of agency problems that came about and the executives were sort of self self-serving uh, and and you know promoting their own interests at the expense of the actual owners and if you know capitalism is all about ownership uh, and so when you have this separation of ownership and control uh, you inevitably get these problems now the solution to that that we that the, the Reagan neoliberal agenda pursued was effectively shareholder capitalism uh, maximizing shareholder value is the goal. We basically changed uh, a lot of the governance structures um, and rules and actually redefined the entire conception of the, of the country legally, in, of, of a company, excuse me, legally and philosophically uh, to allow for this new sort of age of uh, financial shareholders uh, to exert extreme control over these com uh, companies. You also had the development of sort of stock incentives for the executives and things like that, which were supposed to align the shareholders with the uh, executives and employees. Um, now it's clear today that we're in the new crisis is directly related to the outcome of that, that development. And namely, uh, what, we, what we effectively have is, is sort of capitalism without capitalists in the sense of the old sort of entrepreneurial owner or any really long-term owner that can look out for uh, the sort of long-term interest. I mean, I think, you know, the Elizabeth Warren type of formulation is, you know, companies are not just shareholders. They have employees. They have the communities they operate. They have their customers and all of this. Um, but there's effectively all you have are fairly faceless. You either have faceless, unconcerned shareholders or you have very short-term activist shareholders for whom coming in, stripping all the assets out of the company, doing a big share buyback, and then leaving is entirely profitable and in their interest. Um, so I, I think if we want to, to generalize a bit, you can say that you know, neoliberalism has produced this new uh, crisis of ownership uh, mm -hmm. in capitalism. And the result is that, as we discussed already, um, uh, investment has steadily been declining, uh, productivity is declining. This one's more debatable, but innovation and things like that are declining. Um, the only companies, uh, you know, all, the, all the corporate labs, for instance, like Bell Labs, uh, RCA Labs, uh, Xerox Park, they're all gone, effectively. Activist investors force these companies to get rid of these things, use the cash to return the cash to shareholders. Uh, and, 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 I th and there was also, you know, quite in contrast to the 70s, where you had, say, Xerox Park, Palo Alto Research Center, sitting on all the stuff that eventually became Microsoft and Apple, and not knowing what to do with it. And you had Ma Bell sitting on all the stuff that became mobile telephony. Uh, now you have a lot of people going out in Silicon Valley trying to commercialize this stuff in a sort of asset light way. But you don't have any of the big 
fundamental innovation that actually happens. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we've tried to tell our, a story to ourselves, the kind of the individual entrepreneur and innovator. And there may be something to that on the commercialization element, but in the actual innovation, you know, all this stuff was done kind of big labs, you know, kind of unheroic, sort of a lot of people participating, scientists and engineers uh, in that way. Um, so anyway, that's, that's one major casualty uh, of this. Um, I also think that the, uh, well, and I should say that the, you know, financialization sort of, it breeds its own acceleration. Uh, so it's very, it's very hard to exit um, because the more and more, and this may be a problem with markets in general, but the more and more successful that the early activists were attracts more and more capital to pursue the same strategies. And, and so even on the financial strategies, for instance, you had private equity firms in the 80s would come in and buy a company for, you know, three turns of leverage or, uh, you know, I don't know, let's just say, 50% debt to equity, uh, and then, you know, uh, they would they would do their cutting and all of that. And but it was, it was it was uh, arguably necessary, or at least that's what some would say in terms of streamlining all these kind of bloated large corporations. And it wasn't actually burdening these companies with a significant amount of debt that makes it harder and harder for them uh, to invest more. Today, you have companies, private equity firms, you have a lot more of them, the market's more crowded, so they're buying these companies at 13 times leverage or something uh, in, in extreme cases. Uh, and, and, and that makes you know, more cuts even necessary. Uh, and and it, you know, the cycle just continues. And the returns, of course, the private equity firms uh, are lower even though they have more and more capital. Um, Anyway, the result of this is, uh, is, is all the, the symptoms that I think are pretty well understood. Um, and uh, I guess that, if I, if I had anything to expand on you know, what you have been talking about with the sort of isolation of the productive mm -hmm. assets into narrower and narrower parts of the economy, I guess I, what I would point to is this sort of, uh, the, owners, the new ownership uh, crisis that has been uh, revealed as a result of the expansion of the sort of neoliberal shareholder model, both in the public markets and, as I just described, in the, in the private market. And what then is the most promising response to this ownership crisis? The only response that I can see is something like a state-driven industrial policy. Because as I said, the markets themselves have no real potential to correct to this trend of financialization. Um, the only entity that has the, the power to do it is the state. So there's certain very basic things. So since the 70s, for instance, not only, or the 80s, you know, since 1980, not only has corporate investment in basic research and things like that declined, but government investment has declined even faster. So the simplest thing to do would be to restore that. More, on a more complicated level, uh, you know, now that all of the trade incentives and so on have effectively been constructed so that capital intensive industry is highly disincentivized in this country, you would have to, you know, uh, remake the trade regime uh, to make it more possible uh, for this sort of high value added activity. Um, because without that high value added activity, you have all of your workforce uh, becoming baristas and, and low value added sort of service workers, which just cannot drive, pro there's no productivity gains to be had there. Uber drive, there are more people driving in this country than there are in manufacturing. And regardless of which one might be subjectively more enjoyable, uh, there's just no productivity gains to be made in driving people around. So, so um, to the extent that uh, a heightening of public investment is an indispensable element in this response, mm -hmm. one of its preconditions must be a significant rise of the aggregate tax take, right? 
No. Uh, why not? There's no sign. There, you don't. You well. You. Uh, we are fortunately, unlike the Europeans, uh, a sovereign country that can print our own currency. Um, so we don't. You know, we can fund it that way. The question then becomes: Do you get, uh, you know, hyperinflation or more inflation? And the question there. I mean, one. You know, I was actually talking to a uh, uh, head of. Um, it, it's interesting how some of the things have changed. You know, the people in finance are starting to get this. Uh, so anecdotally, I was, I was talking to kind of a very senior guy in finance. You'd never expect to say some of these things, but he's saying, you know, this country has been underinvested for, you know, 30, 40 years. The only way to actually rebuild this infrastructure and stuff, you're going to have to have at least 4% inflation. Like, we're going to have to adjust the inflation target, which I think is probably true. But the issue is, uh, you know, if you just print a lot of money and do a bunch of public works, do you get hyperinflation, uh, which is, of course, a problem. And the real, you know, as long as you are building new things, creating more productivity, you will not. Uh, if you simply redistribute and dig holes in the ground, maybe eventually you will. But again, as long as, uh, and, that, and that, that again would be a, a worry about the redistribution only model. But, but just if to we be can clear, focus on the productive element. But just to be clear about what you're saying, what you're saying is that the alternative to raising the tax take is printing money. Yeah, that's the best alternative. I mean, if, if you simply increase taxes, you, you won't, it, it, you would actually get less growth. Um, it depends. What well, you I mean, do with them. I, I, I should say, I should, I should rephrase that. But, yeah. uh, you know, right now you have all these, these, this wealth sitting idly in financial assets. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. could take that and not have uh, a major problem. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you, if you build something and if you build a new asset and then simply tax all the gains from it, that sort of defeats the purpose. You would much rather, you know, borrow money, print money, to build the asset. But if you and then tax it, you know, later to control inflation. So, so, but the first line traditional objection to statist industrial policy in the old model is its dogmatic character, even when it is not then vulnerable to cronyism and corruption. So, and it seems that the character of this advanced knowledge economy is in some way incompatible with this simple centralized direction. That is, it would, it would require the introduction of a significant element of ex experimentation in the, in the organization of this industrial policy. So a new way of acting of the administrative apparatus. I, right, I, I don't think we can simply repeat the old style that of a centralized bureaucracy. Fordism. I mean, yeah. I, I think we need to do some of that, and I think there's too much yeah. skepticism on that. And, and at least in terms of setting the sort of big picture goals, there's, there's no substitute for planning. You have to plan. You have to decide what strategic uh, outcomes you pursue. But then in terms of the more tactical pursuit of that, uh, yeah, we, 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 can't for, we simply can't replicate you know, the old 1950s model if for the simple reason that, say, the corporate labs don't exist anymore. Um, and just to pick one thing I talked about. So yes, I think there, there's going to have to be a new, we're, we're going to have to utilize uh, resources a bit differently, and, and the current corporate structure and the universities and so on mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in, in US history, really, this stuff has, and uh, it's worth pointing out, you know, the <clears throat> people, talk about the US as such an anti-statist country, but really the most celebrated elements of American history were all extremely statist, whether, whether it was the founding or Lincoln or especially World War II. The World War. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, for instance, do you know how many civilian passenger cars were produced in the, 19, in the United States between 1942 and 45? It was something like 178, something like that. I mean. The, this country can do planning, um, but when it does that, it, the, only, the only elite it can, can use to do that are kind of bringing in people from the business elite to sort of execute these things. Mm. Uh, well, you, you've got Frederick Hayek turning yeah. over in his yeah. grave, you know that. Right? But yes. the point is, that, the yes, point is but that even FDR had a lot of experimentation yeah. and improvisation yes. in terms of yes. state senate. 
I but have I think control that you're, I think that you're underestimating in your description the difficulty of the task of developing an alternative to what you could call administrative Fordism. That is, if you say this economy is no longer Fordist mass production, it's post-Fordist, we need the administrative counterpart to that. And that doesn't exist yet. Uh, and that's a whole distinct task in itself. But the other side of this, though, if the state is going to be able to do what you want it to do, then that means we're talking about massive mobilization of citizens who have a very different perception of the nature of the crisis to bring power and pressure to bear on those monopolies, oligopolies in the private sector that are going to resist the very thing that you're calling for. Because the state at the moment is very much colonized I, by precisely those well, financial elite interests. I, I actually, and this maybe gets into the democracy element, I, I, I tend to think that the only way this can happen is if you eventually get a sizable enough portion of the elite that sees it as the only or best alternative. Um, so you're looking and, to the elite. And so and the I, I tend to see the, the kind of, you know, much like, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be only one way, but you know, in the in the old uh, you know FDR state, uh, <laughs> they, the state mobilized the massive the Hollywood and massive cultural resources to create the popular um, spirit, uh, or at least accentuate what might have already been there. Um, we frankly have to be much more candid about that, uh, and you know, I think a nice public arts works project would be fantastic. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but you can't downplay the, in the, the service, pressure from below that the FDR In the service of a war Trump economy without you had a war. collective bargaining, trade union movement, anti-racism. Well, movement. there was there was no there wasn't a war until, you know, the 40s. Yes. So. And, but when well, the war came, came America, had a long time. That, that's Many, when economic growth really picked that's up. That's when it took off. Uh, yeah. But you know they, they were doing this stuff well before the war. I mean, check out the movie Footlight Parade if you want to if you want to see it in the American context. Should we open it up? Yes. But what about women? Women? I think we had three brothers in a row. Any sisters? Any sisters? Yes. You all have to talk more loudly for the people behind you to hear. more eloquent version of my question. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I guess um, I'm not sure what you mean by the role of the. I, I think the question, as I interpret it, is this. That as you described it, this project of reinventing planning, mobilizing resources on a large scale, is organized around an elite consensus. So it's as if it were a task of the elites. And the question that's being asked, what's the role of the ordinary man and woman in this project of the elites? I, th I think, the, I think in, a, in a lot of ways, um, the ordinary voter has, has already expressed uh, their desire for this kind of change. So that's the first role. Uh, and maybe you know, they can wake up the elites uh, and, and maybe make the elites nervous. Um, the second role is uh, whether whether they you know I, they simply participate in it. I mean, uh, the ordinary person is going to get to decide whether they like it or not. And you uh, mean as a voter? Yeah, and, and not even simply as a voter, but um, as a part of the society. I mean, you know, yeah. whether or not you know, pe people know. Uh, People are sensitive to these things. But I, for I, example, I, I, I see, I see this more as, uh, you know, right now the ordinary voter has, has very few opportunities. Um, so I think if you use the state to create more opportunities, uh, you will you will see very quickly whether they embrace this, or if they don't. Yeah, but one but one way to develop the question is to say. Will the ordinary person have only political agency, that is, checking what is done by the elites through the vote, yeah. 
or will the ordinary person also have economic agency so that the economic arrangements increase in some way I see the opportunities for well, engagement? Once it's implemented, that would be a major part of the goal. I guess right now, they don't. Uh, that's been the result. That's where we are. But that um, would involve innovations in corporate law, in the law of ownership, uh, in the distribution of stakes in productive assets, and so forth. The enhancement yes. of economic agency. Yes. Uh, the so in other words, the, in this whole picture, I was asking you before, when you talk about planning, yeah. presumably you don't have in mind simply the perpetuation of the planning of the early and mid 20th century. It's, it's not this dogmatic apparatus which at the center gives the marching orders. There's, it's, it's, organ, it's an organization of experimentalism. And similarly, with respect to the arrangements of private law, the law of contract and property and corporation, that too would be reformed to increase the opportunities for agency from below. So it's not a simple operation of continuing what we used to call planning, but it's the invention of a sequel to it. I, I think that is a very admirable vision. I hope we get there. I guess all I'm trying to say is that at this point, I mainly, you know, I, I run a journal that writes, publishes 5,000 word essays on Hegel. I am mainly concerned about the elites. <laughs> I think the elites are the, the elite, it is the elite commitment to neoliberalism and, and a sort of a, an embrace of a morality by the elites that perpetuates uh, their status uh, at the expense of everyone else that I'm most concerned about. So I am primarily focused on trying to shift uh, elite opinion um, to move away from the neoliberal embrace. Uh, I think substantively, yes, the only way that this, or you know, every single element of this is dependent on um, ordinary citizens having a greater stake in the system as they have virtually none now, including in the actual high value economic production system, um, whether as defined as laborers or some kind of new arrangement, uh, new kind of new kind stake. of corporate system. Um, I, don't, I don't have a specific uh, program for that. That's why you can write for the journal. But, um, <laughs> but I, I, I do, yeah, but well, I, well, I am but, primarily but focused but on I, the leadership. You shouldn't downplay your, your calling, though, as someone who wants to create dissensus among elites in terms of shaping the opinion that has a disproportionate amount of influence. This is a very important role. That's one of the reasons why we teach at Harvard to create dissensus among elite formation. Well, I, I so think those who will matriculate through can gain access to different stories, visions, analysis of what's at stake so that when you go out into the world, you can be much more Socratic and courageous in that regard. That is a role, but at the same time, there's gotta be pressure from below. There's gotta be ways in which mobilization of ordinary citizens who can gain access to politicians who are not captured by the elite interest in the private sector. Because if you get anti-democratic forces from above, Wendy Brown makes this in her recent book on the ruins of neoliberalism, and anti-democratic mobilization below. In part, that's what's happening with Trump. That Trump engages in this pseudo-populist language, then he gets there, and he's got anti-democratic and xenophobic elements mobilized and still captive to big money and big military. And that's headed toward authoritarian regime on a massive re in a massive way. And at that point, we all become comrades because we're all on the way to some serious uh, prison time. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's what neo-fascism would do to folks who are concerned about rights and liberties and so forth. So we got another question. One more question, and then we'll. Okay, question. Yes. Yeah. 
first of all, I'm not separating economics and moral moralism. Neoliberalism did that, uh, mm -hmm. or in any event, <clears throat> it tried to pr pr produce the notion that uh, you could only get to the certain moral outcomes you liked through one market organization, um, and. My, to the extent I have a, I have discussed the moral issues, it's that we have substituted a sort of personal morality uh, instead of thinking about any real collective. Um, the issue on the elites, I think we need to be very honest with, uh, about the situation in this country. It's very nice to talk about democracy, but the fact is that the top 10 families control half a trillion dollars of wealth. Um, there's effectively, you know, we're already in the oligarchy. It's talking about mobilizing people from below is great. Uh, where are you going to get the money to do that? The unions are gone. The institutions that used to do that are basically gone. Mm. There is no mm. source of any, of any uh, you know, material means by which to do this, except the existing oligarchical class. So the only way to actually, uh, I shouldn't say the only way, but to me the most really sensible way or you know, practical way outside of, I, I don't know what, is to, uh, you have to use their sort of moral commitments Mm. Uh, the, the moral commitments they use to legitimate themselves against them uh, and also use, uh, manipulate elite competition, inter-elite competition against them. Um, so I, look, mm. if, you, if you can go out and, and organize uh, a sort of you know, real populist uh, sort of bottom-up movement, uh, I'm not going to stop you. I just don't see practically how that's going to happen unless you can co-opt at least some significant portion of the elite resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, let's turn the conversation to, to we'll, nationalism and democracy. Absolutely, that's a natural segue. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sober note, though. It's a very sober note in that regard. Um, I mean, the Sanders campaign for you, wouldn't that be a bottoms-up campaign? I think it's trying to be. We'll I mean, 2016. Uh, it seems like it, but it failed. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. No, we're just talking about the process. We're not talking about yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think it's, it's fairly instructive Absolutely. in this regard. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you're testing the limits of, of what's that's left right. of this. That's right. And I, you know, I mean, I look, I look at the sort of makeup of the current Democratic Party, and the fact is, you have, you know, the Republican Party is probably, you know, easier to to deal with in this respect, and that's why Trump could win, because you know, the core constituency of the Democratic Party is a bunch of people who live in six million dollar homes in Wellesley, Massachusetts, who are going to say all the nice things, but when it comes down to seventy percent tax rates, they may not be there. Um, against the majority of the country. Because <laughs> we want 70% tax rate, as you know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the Democratic Party is, seems to me, because the Republicans have, it's not, of course it's not that the corporations don't like the Republican agenda, but the Republican Party is basically seen as an embarrassment and an anathema to all the largest corporate entities. The, the, you know, Facebook executives, all these guys, they don't want to be seen with any of these sort of Republican people. Uh, and this means that the Republican Party is actually kind of easier to, uh, to dissociate if you actually had someone who would start to speak to them uh, yeah. as, as, as real partners in a coalition instead of maybe attacking them for, for their moral views or things like that. That that as as we started with is the mm -hmm. is the is the block, um, but in in terms of democracy, I I think we should.
uh, maybe to try to be a little contrarian, I will, you know, we should be careful about, uh, democracy is a thro word thrown around with a lot of sort of moral uh, overtones, and, and we use it. I, I think the more that democracy has been used in this country, the more it comes to be used as sort of an excuse uh, that passes for, you know, you don't need performance legitimacy um, or even, you know, the basic uh, sort of popular legitimacy. You just appeal to the kind of moral aura of democracy. You say we're a democracy. That's it. Um, and I also think we should we should be fairly uh, clear-eyed about what democracy is. There's always going to be an elite. Uh, the elite's always going to exercise a disproportionate amount of influence, whether that elite is defined by money, whether it's defined by credentials, or whatever. Uh, what democracy does is basically channel this elite competition into popular elections. Uh, it forces the elites to compete with each other by having to appeal to the people. Uh, and there are obviously, uh, the obvious positive implication of this is that it's supposed to tie the elites to the people and make the elites more responsive uh, to the actual needs uh, of the people. What has happened, I think, in recent years is that democracy has become a way to insulate the elites from the people. Uh, mm. Because again, it, it's the, you don't need to actually, or uh, let, me, let me phrase it a different way. The way that democracy is uh, justified now is almost entirely on these moral grounds. Um, preserves freedom, it's, you know, it's just, it's morally better, uh, prevents abuses, things like that. It used to be that you would talk about democracy on very practical grounds. It works better. Authoritarian systems don't work, democracies work. Or democracies can adjust more quickly to changing circumstances. They can correct for failure better. If you look actually at the, at the you know, recent US history, I don't know that that's true. It seems, as we've been discussed, there's an, an incredible amount of institutional obstacles uh, to change. If you just look at, for example, the, the upper level of, of political and business elites, there seems to be no failure <laughs> that can ever cause these people to suffer any consequences. Uh, worst case, you lose an election, you become a lobbyist. Um, but, but, you know, at the Fed, for example, you know, Ben Bernanke, all the, you know, they got everything completely wrong. They're still celebrated. Um, they're still treated as, you know, right. eminent people. Uh, so to the extent I think we should be thinking about democracy, um, we need to restore the sort of substantive, practical uh, outcomes that it's supposed to be associated with. And I think to talk about it independent of those outcomes risks turning it into uh, just a, a, another form of legitimating the exact opposite, which is sort of where we are, which you have this dominance by a very narrow oligarchical elite that trumpets its democratic values um, and, and, and of course observes all the sort of election for, well, Bernie might disagree with that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> observes a lot of the official rules of the elections. Uh, but at the end of the day, has sort of isol moved all of the power into things like the Fed, like the Supreme Court, uh, into these bureaucratic uh, organizations um, that, are, that are, you know, you can put whatever congressman you want in there, they're not actually going to change anything. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that you're, you know, going back to the 18th century model of citizen legislators is not going to happen. Um, so I look to the early progressives uh, as maybe mm. more of the model in which, in a sense, they were very open about the need that there would be an elite leadership uh, and there would be a bureaucratic element, a strong bureaucratic element to government. What I think the difference was is they were very open about this and, and the agencies they created 
uh, were very clearly politicized and, and very kind of easy to, to assess. So if you have an agency that's supposed to go out and electrify the Tennessee Valley, you can then look back and see if the Tennessee Valley has been electrified or not. But when you have, we have, in contrast, set up all of our executive agencies as these kind of bizarre procedural uh, sort of mini judiciary systems where, you know, for instance, everyone wants to talk about how critically important the, the independence of the Fed is. Um, why? Why shouldn't the Fed be tied to a clear political goal? I think in a way, though on the one hand, that would seemingly empower bureaucrats uh, more. On the other hand, by making them more directly responsible uh, in, in clearly definable ways to some level of democratic accountability uh, would be a more effective way to uh, restore the kind of substantive elements of democracy rather than the purely procedural and moralistic mm -hmm. ones. Now, it, it, it seems, though, just philosophically, and you tell me what you think, though, brother, that um, Nietzsche, Foucault, Walter Littman, persons who are preoccupied with the operations of power. The Reinhold Niebuhr, Moral Man in the Moral Society, 1932, is really about power. Now, we can talk about mobilizing citizens, Dewey versus Lippmann in the 1920s. The elites are here to stay. The citizens have limited impact even when they're mobilized. Therefore, you have to create some elite contestation and conflict for some kind of social change to be made with end results discernible. Is that fair? I think I'm, yes, fairly no. close to that. But, but, but given that, though, I mean, it, 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 this is where Sheldon Wolin comes in, where he argues, well, there's no such thing as a democratic state. The only time democracy is really at work is when it's fugitive, when it's putting pressure and power to bear. The moment it enters the state, it's always already going to be co-opted with certain kind of concessions. But the elites are still going to be very much in the driver's seat, but in a different zone, a different moment. And so it looks as if there's a kind of pessimism in yes, your but view But then we about give democracy. up the project of changing the state. Well, the name of the course yeah. is American democracy, yeah. you know. Uh, but what, what do you say about that? Is, is that fair in terms of certain pessimism I discern in terms of America, uh, possi democratic possibilities of ordinary citizens? Well, I, I, I think that the early progressive movement restored possibilities um, mm. in, in, in mm -hmm. substance and in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the notion that you know, getting rid of this, you know, it's, it's just the inverse. It, the idea you know, that you, if you just get rid of the state, you will solve all the power oh, conflicts. Right, right. We this know that's this right. we know is not, that's this right. is what we've learned. That's right, we get that uh, off the table. Yeah, so uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a sense, I think, you know, I would say, yeah, there, there, it's, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of anti-utopian in that respect. Sure. There is gonna be an elite, we should accept it, we should just try to channel it in the right directions, and, um, and, and that's, that's the best outcome you can get. But I also, I kind of, I, I, I sort of, I reject, I, I think it's very easy to sort of lay out, and maybe a very quintessential American tradition to kind of lay out this sort of um, perfect, spontaneous, kind of the you know, totally non-hierarchical political system. But that in itself um, seems to me to, to, to uh, be substantively worse in that it, that it leads to a more exploitative uh, mm -hmm. set of, of, of economic uh, and, and, and political arrangements. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. But it's the I, sharing of power that's at the center of the substantive conception of democracy. Well, but, but for this example. Rule we, of demos. Yeah, it's got to be sharing of power. But we haven't way. discussed, and we don't really have time in this session to discuss, the alter, alternative constitutional arrangements. And it, it came up briefly in our course. But mm -hmm. it's not as if uh, uh, representative democracy had a single possible institutional form. There's a range of variations that exist in the world. Some are more elitist than others. And uh, have, they have different problems and different potential. But I think we have to bracket that discussion because we can't really enter it into, into it in detail. But a simple idea of an iron law of oligarchy must have its limit in the discussion of the different institutional ways of organizing a, a democratic life. 
which would at the very least modify the play of the oligarchies. Well, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to, to argue for. Yes. And I, I'm simply saying, you know, you shouldn't let the, the perfect be the, the enemy of the good. Yeah. So if we say, for example, that in its constitutional tradition, the United States has been a proto-democratic liberalism, one can imagine a trajectory in which it would, it, would, it would become more democratic over time. It's not what we're discussing now. Right. Well, I think it it, it, yeah. it has changed. Yes, it has I mean, changed. It, it, it has the changed. The early progressives uh, yeah. uh, changed it's, it very significantly. It's, it's, it has changed, and there's a very important point about this, which is that sometimes the reformers of politics think that the reform of politics to make it more democratic is an antecedent condition. But the reality is that no country reforms its politics in order only later to decide what to do with the reform politics. That's the actual reform of, of the political and constitutional arrangements takes place only in the midst of a struggle to change the economic and social direction. And, and then you, you, you change the institutions only when you need to change them to achieve the social and economic effect. So one might say that this program that you're beginning to advocate would have constitutional implications, but the constitutional implications would be revealed and worked out only in the course of time. Yes, yeah, and, and I think again, uh, focusing maybe on the, the sort of key, the substantive issues of, of, how, of the economic system that you want to change, et cetera, is essential in defining yes. whatever con procedural elements. And one other thing I would say is that you know, I think Trump, Trump has the, this effect of sort of forcing to the surface what everyone kind of knows but wants to keep hidden. I mean, say what you will about him. He, he sort of does this in a lot of areas. One of the things he's done is to show that, you know, with this emergency stuff, is you can basically do whatever you want and, and no one can stop you. And uh, I think that actually, I, I am actually, I think that's a, it's a good thing that there is that new kind of awareness of, of uh, institutional kind of fluidity that, that you, know, you, you know, really one person. Because that's what populism is. Well, populism that, is if, a, you, if you need reform, you-, you Populism know, you is a kind of liquefaction. Yeah. So its strength, but also its weakness, is that it has no definite institutional form. Correct. Which is then the opportunity for, for those who would step into the vacuum and do what the populace cannot do by the very nature of their exercise. Now. I, I, could you just give us, before we turn to the final subject of the social class and political alliances that could sustain this redirection, just a word about nationalism and how you see the reinterpretation of nationalism in the light of these ideas. Um, I feel like I, I maybe already uh, spoke about this. I mean, uh, to me, what we're, what we're calling nationalism now is, I think, most fundamentally a desire to, to reaffirm some kind of political collective. Uh, I think actually at its fundamental, this is maybe more my opinion than actual fact, but it's a, de it's a desire to, for a state. Um, the, uh, and, and uh, you know, Further to what you said earlier, I, I, Irving Kristol had a nice phrase, which is, I think is actually very good, is that he always preferred the term nationalism over patriotism because nationalism contains with it a sense of the future, um, which is perhaps also what uh, makes it a bit more dangerous, shall we say. But I think uh, you know, fundamentally what you're having is this, this desire to, to, to uh, redefine some sort of political collective um, that would be uh, sovereign. Uh, and return, you could call it repoliticization, where we have had the depoliticization of everything and everything is given to markets or very, very parapolitical entities, uh, the WTO, what have you. Um, there's a desire to reassert uh, the political collective and the political control. Now, exactly. And also the counter majoritarian institutions like the Fed or the Supreme Court. Sure, and so yeah. forth. Um, the, uh, the, the challenge with nationalism, as I mentioned, is that I think right now there is a, a struggle uh, 
at least within the right, to define this in terms of a sort of state-centered nationalism or some kind of you know, precursor to the state nationalism, which would be more on a um, maybe like a Steve Bannon kind of cultural uh, orientation. I actually think the, the state-centered one will win because it's, um, it, it, it simply can address uh, greater problems, uh, you know, real material problems, um, but it's not over yet. And, and Trump has obviously, I think, started by bringing this to the fore. Um, but as I said in an article that I think he was signed, I think he, he often uh, retreats from this and appeals to the sort of you know, prejudicial elements uh, of, of, uh, of these things. On the other hand, I think for the left, there is uh, the opposition to nationalism is basically, or the, the globalism of the left is effectively a form of libertarianism. Uh, it's, it's Hayek for left-wingers. Uh, it's the view that, you know, I don't have to be tied to any existing political collective. Um, and and I, I would actually even admit that there's a certain amount of logic to it, um, to, to desire to have one sort of global uh, unity. But where I, where I disagree most strongly with the left's critique of nationalism, the conventional left today, is that they don't actually assert a global community, a global political community, uh, with any sincerity either. And they effectively just, if they, th you know, they rely on a sort of promotion of a, of a sort of global moralism without actually attempting to honestly or in any practical fashion construct something like a global democracy or any kind of uh, actually existing uh, global political community. The result being that you, you go around and assert a lot of global norms, but there's no actual people uh, to define these norms against, to judge the actions against, uh, or anything like that. It, it's, again, the, the net effect is, is a sort of libertarianism. You, you get to criticize all of the tangible existing political collectives, the, organiz the, the actual states that could intervene in the global economy to actually accomplish what you want, um, by criticizing them as sort of immoral or exclusionary or whatever, um, but you don't actually offer any, any alternative. And even if you did, the logical alternative is not especially practical anyway. So that's, I think, essentially where we are on nationalism. I think it will probably, it's also, I think, maybe what's causing the right to move a little bit faster on the political economy questions, uh, perhaps surprisingly. Um, because it is able to, uh, it is able to tie together the material and, and the non-material values uh, in, a, in a very sort of straightforward way. That's already consistent with what a lot of so-called ordinary people uh, understand anyway. So our time is drawing to a close, and I, I didn't want the class to end without you <laughs> telling us what you think are the steps by which we could form the alliances, both the political alliances and the social or class alliances, that would be, as it were, the other side of this project. Um, yes, I think, I think the, first, the first part is to realize where the actual lines of division are in, in American politics. Uh, and as I said, you, you can look at the polling data. You can go and talk to people. I, it's, all, um, it's all pretty well known. Uh, but there's no actual institutional capacity to say, bring people like us together, or bring people like you together with maybe some you know, very, very religious people who you may not agree with them on abortion or whatever, but whom you would have total agreement with on, on issues of political economy. Uh, and it's not, you know, it's very strange, for instance, you know, <clears throat> you have one party with, I don't know, say a Mike Bloomberg and another party with the Kochs. Uh, and then everyone kind of aligns around these, you know, fake polls. Um, not, not everybody, but, but <laughs> well, a lot, too people many. are forced to. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah but not everybody, though. Either. So, so it, it's a question to me of, of, of building the institutions uh, that can, can, you know, shift the, the disputes and, and maybe mediate mm. some of the internal mm. disputes along a different axis. Uh, 
this is starting now. I mean, you know, we're slowly starting to do that. And I think there's, once, once you throw out the idea, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, but, uh, but again, the, you know, all of the institutional money and existing uh, powers are against you. Um, so uh, th that would be step one. A and I think part of it is just a generational thing. I think it will, uh, you know, I was talking earlier, on the right, you know, if your, your major events were the collapse of the Soviet Union, revitalization of cities like New York, et cetera, you have one perspective. You know, younger people, it's uh, the financial crisis, the Iraq war, student loans, and so on. Um, it's going to happen sort of but, but eventually. Take a, but, but, but take a specific yeah. issue, which is, <clears throat> which is telling about the larger question of alliances. The, the political orientation of the small business class, the estrangement of which was fatal in the 20th century to the European left, and the small business class in the United States seems to have an importance that goes beyond its numerical significance because its sensibility, in, is, in, in a sense, has historically set the tone of the country. Mm -hmm. So now, the small business class is said to have an anti-statist ideology or sensibility. And so there's the question, how could this alliance win the small business class as, as part of this lar larger majoritarian coalition? If it can win the small business class, it can win the rest. I don't know if it can win the small business class per se, that is, as the small business class itself. What it can win is, say, a, a grouping that is organized around a sense of, say, a national development or a redevelopment of, of rural areas um, and so on where the small business class actually lives. If you address them as the small business class, uh, I think you, you, know, you may have ceded too much ground. Um, if you address them as, as the uh, class most in need of uh, a, a broader economic development, that, you know, I, I realize that I'm, I don't want to oversell too much like spin and semantics. But I, you know, I think if we conceive of them purely as a small business class, we miss the point. But if you speak to their pain and channel their pain through a vision that has been critical of the kinds of elites and its status quo, you have a real possibility there. Uh, yes, and I, I don't, Absolutely. I don't think the um, the the small business class is especially uh, favorable to the financial class exactly. uh, or, or large tech yeah, you know, If you're a small business owner on Amazon, you'll probably wake up one day and find that Amazon is now selling your product at a lower price. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, as long as the current situation prevails, they're very dependent on it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think yeah. the, the first step uh, it would be to you know, radicalize them or politicize them against the existing powers in the economy. And by, by pointing out, for instance, the lack of geographic distribution. And begin set. to offer them opportunity. And, and that's, when, that's when it ceases to be the sort of neoliberal small business class and becomes a, mm -hmm. a sort of future-oriented. Mm -hmm. By giving them economic and yeah. not just political Correct. opportunities. But you know, before we opportunities leave. Opportunities for uplift. Uh, that one last point and put my dear brother here, though, because there's a certain kind of pessimism that I'm discerning that I hate to see among young brothers and sisters uh, who's not as old as I am. There's a realism that is in pessimism that's healthy, it seems to me to keep track of the constraints and limitations or operations of power. But in terms of the roles of unpredictable elements and forces, you see, such as social movements in the history of the United States, one of the reasons why social movements are so important is precisely because the entrenched elite interest has been so overwhelming, you see, 
if we were here in the 1830s at Harvard Law, right, you got a slaveholding democracy. You talk about abolishing slavery, people thought you were crazy. If we were here in the 1890s, it would be a Jim Crow democracy. People talk about overcoming yeah. Jim Crow, you got almost 100 years. Yeah, course, so yeah. that the, the role of social movements is very important yeah. here, especially for a younger generation, because there's a generational divide. You would, you would acknowledge that, right? Oh, Young yeah. folk under 35 yeah. live in a different world than me and you. Yes. Uh, so that in that sense, that the pessimism has to be tied to some sense of hope. Well, something even deeper than hope, namely a willingness to explore unpredictable alternatives so that the action <laughs> produces the yes. hope and being the hope. Cornell. I don't like the dialogue about hope because it's already yeah. been no. colonized. I'm talking about the ways in which you yeah. engage it. Yeah. Cornell, you're coming over to my side. So, oh. so, 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 so. You done brought us together. I, I have that effect on you. So when, so when you like pessimism, you call it tragic. When you don't like it, you call it deficient in hope. So. <laughs> Let's give it up for our brother here. Rich dialogue. Very rich dialogue.